We're good to go. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, welcome. Welcome back. Okay. So um, a, a, a couple more examples before we go into some of the uh, the use cases and uh, applicability and, and and so on. So um, did any of you have any questions during the break? No? It all started to make more sense. Maybe if you sleep on it, maybe tomorrow it'll make more sense too. So keep thinking about this stuff. Um, Anyone here? Anyone here from Globe? Globe Telecom? No, no one from Globe. Okay, all right. So, um, what we what we talked about was um, this is going to be challenging now with my, my laptop. There, um, we 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 look at looked at an example with uh, adjacency segments, and and earlier on we looked at an example with um, with node segments, right? So the thing here is that it's it's not either or. You can use them together. So I'll just go through an example where we where we show both um, node and adjacent segments. So let me just uh, next one. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, we we looked at an example with uh, node sets, and we've uh, looked at an example with adjacent sets as well. So this example here is with a combination of node and adjacency sits. Um, and, and with this interesting exercise, so Sura said that was, that was really good. You saw how you can get creative, right? And, and, and that, that's the beauty about um, traffic engineering in, in that you, you can actually um, you know, get pretty creative in terms of how you route your traffic around the network without regard to the shortest path forwarding. You can, you can bypass that and, and, and achieve some, some other objectives, right? Business objectives, potentially. So, um, right. So in this example here, it's going to be a bit challenging for me. I'm going to come here so I can look at my laptop. Um, in this example, what, what we want to do is we want to send traffic from, uh, or is that going to work? Sorry, guys, just give us a second. You know, I, I just need to look at the screen. Okay, so um, the the example here is is actually quite quite similar to what we had before, right? So what we want to do is we want to send traffic here um, from P one to P two, and we we want to use that link between P five and P six, right? Uh, for for whatever reason, like I said, it could be any any sort of business reason that you want. So previously we saw how we can do it with adjacency segments. We also looked at uh, an alternative uh, to uh, an alternative routing. Um, that use node SIDs and a combination of adjacency SIDs as well. So here, one of the things we can do here is we can use a label um, stack of 300, 1,003, and 800, right? So what's that going to do? Can anyone tell me what, what that label stack is going to do? Okay, so go to P2 first and then? And then go to P5.
So three, okay, let's, let's work this out, okay? So it's, it's got a stack of 300, 1,300, 800. So firstly, it sends it out. Um, and as we, as we said, it's, um, you have a rule on P1 that puts it on the wire to P1. So to these, so that's the way we ensure that the traffic is going to go through P1, right? So it gets to P1. Um, the active segment is 300, okay? So P1 um, does a swap. Now, this is, look, I mean, think, let's think about it. What is the semantic of a node set? What does a node set instruct your network to do? Shortest path. Shortest path, yeah. It's a set the packet to the destination via the shortest path. So the, the destination is the node with a set of 300, which is P2, right? So at P1, we haven't reached P2. So what instruction is that? Like what, what operation is that? Anyone? What, what second routing operation are we performing on P1 when we swap 300 for 300? What is that operation? Continue. Continue, exactly. So that's a continue operation because we're not done with that segment yet. So it does that continue operation, which in an MPLS is a swap, a sends it off to P2. It gets to P2. Now P2 is, has, or P2 has um, a SID of 300, a node SID of 300. So what's, what's it going to do? What operation is P2 going to do? Pop. It's a pop. But what is the, pop is the MPLS way of saying it. What's the segment routing? Next, absolutely. You guys are on the ball here. So this is this is awesome. So um, it's a next operation. It does a next operation. Um, when it does a next operation, which, you know, it, it strips off the 300, what's left? 1,003, right? What does it do then? What, what does 1,003 1, signify to P2? The adjacency set, absolutely. So it says send it down to P5. So it pops that as well because that bit is done. So it does a next operation on that as well. It goes down to P5. Um, and P5, at, at P5, it's got a uh, operation of swap uh, 800. Yeah, you know what? This is, there's a bug here. That's, that's not right. So, okay. Can anyone tell me what's going on here? Apart from the fact that there's a bug in this. <laughs> no, so, uh, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. The, uh, there's a copy and paste thing. Assume that this is not there, the metric of 100. That, that should be deleted. In fact, I'll delete it now. Right, it gets to P... Um, P5 here, and it's left with a SID of active segment of 800. So what does it do? It sends it to P5, uh, sorry, P6. P6 does a pop, right? And it sends it out. To, so now question for you guys, are we using PHP in this example or not? Yes. Absolutely, we are using PHP. So just to confuse you, some of these examples are PHP, some don't, uh, but I think you understand this now. Okay, so that makes sense, right? Yep. <clears throat> no. Yeah. No. So if, if the if the metric there was one hundred, then um, if you had that label stack in there, what would happen is that the packet would go up this way, go to P two, go to P three, and then go to P two. Uh, what are you going to change the label stack? I mean, if, if, if uh, we change the adjacencies to yeah, on the back, right? Yeah, yeah. But if, let me say if you had that, was, if that is a metric of 100, and oh, thank you so much. Like this, yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. 
There you go. Thanks. All right. I think we're back in business here. Um, okay. So, so yeah. So, so the question here is, if there was a metric of, whoops, if that was a metric of 100, let's just say, let's go with that for now. Let's assume that metric was 100 and your, um, your, your, your uh, MPLS label stack was exactly the same as this, right? It will look at 800 uh, as the, as the uh, active segment and P5 would then send it back to P2. In a segment routing network, there's nothing stopping traffic from doing a U-turn, okay? Because you're telling the network. If this was any other kind of routing behavior, it would not do that because there would be a, a potential for a loop and so on. In a segment routing uh, traffic engineered environment, it doesn't really care. So it's gonna send it back to P2 and P2 would have sent it to P3. And then P3 would have sent it to P2. So that's what would have happened. So if, if that metric was higher or was 100, then you would have had to have the adjacency sit. Otherwise, it would not have done the right thing. Yep. Okay. Right. So um, now that we've kind of looked at the basics of segment routing, I think all of you have seem to have a really good grasp of how this works. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good idea to actually compare, you know, segment routing against LDP and RSVTE. So the same kind of parameters. Uh, segment routing, like LDP, is multi-point to point because the same node SID can be used by any of the nodes in the network, right? To send traffic to it. So it, it, it's, once again, a tree-like structure there. The operation uh, from a shortest path first perspective is actually quite simple. You know, in, in the examples that we gave, you kind you of enable it, right? And it happens. Um, in terms of dependencies, it relies on the IGP. Right, so because we're doing shortest path first for the node sets, but it also relies on some sort of offline traffic engineering capability. I'll come back to that point because that's really important. Label allocation is global, right? As we saw, can we support traffic engineering? Of course we can. That's what we've been done doing for the last half an hour. We've done traffic engineering, right? And all of you have done it together with me. Um, scaling is actually very efficient. The, the, the only labels you're burning are for your node sits and your adjacency sits. That's it. You know, you're not scaling it um, uh, in, in proportion to the number of tunnels. So your scale is actually very good. Fast reroute, we haven't really covered it, but because your traffic engineering, you can actually build these traffic engineered bypass uh, no tunnels and so on, which ensure that you get 100% coverage and IPv6 natively supported. So here, I'm just going to go back to one of the slides before I go forward. Um, so question, right? That one of you have ha, has asked me so far, uh, but but none of, none of the rest of you have asked me. Um, and the question is, how does P1 know that it's going to use this label stack? Thank you. I was going to come to that. So how does PE1 know about this? Remember, there's no signaling. We're not doing any signaling here. How does PE1 know this? Via the IGP? No. Yeah, the IGP will tell you this. It'll tell you the 300, right? It'll, it'll tell you, IGP will tell you all the SIDs, the four, node SID 400, node SID 300, 200, 500, so on. What it doesn't tell you is how to use it. So where does that information come in? You need an orchestrator. Or you could go and do it manually, but that doesn't scale, right? So you need some sort of an SDN controller. So here's where things start to get really interesting. To, we, to, to really exploit this kind of a network, you need an SDN controller. An SDN controller or something that has visibility of the network. So the SDN controller actually knows this topology layout. It knows the SIDs. It knows all of that stuff. And then it's got, you know, it's, it's got some logic there that says, I want to achieve this kind of traffic engineering. And to do that, I need to take this path. So it has to then communicate with the provider edge device so that that provider edge device can then put the label stack on, right? It doesn't have that knowledge itself. So... That's one of the one of the consequences of using source-based routing. 
right? If you're going to do source-based routing, the source has got to know the route, right? If you did network-based routing, which is what we've you know, uh, uh, been, been doing in RSVTE and so on, then the network is state that helps that packet to make its way to the destination. So that's how we get that. Uh, that's a bit more complicated, right? Today, we're going to focus on the data plane aspects of it. But uh, just, just so you know, that's how it actually gets that information. <clears throat> okay. So um, looking at use cases and applicability. So, so what I've got here is, is a bunch of different use cases. So there's just examples. So, so like I said, uh, we, we may or may not have the chance to go through all of them, uh, but, I'll, but I'll just go through them in sequence. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll stop when, whenever I know the, the session runs out, but, but they're all different variants on a theme, on different things you can achieve with this. Uh, it'll, it'll give you some idea of the different ways you can use segment routing in your network. Okay, so the basic use case is shortest path routing. Um, in an MPLS network, as we discussed earlier, what protocol do we use to give us shortest path routing? What MPLS protocol do we use? LDP, yeah. So we've been using LDP to get us shortest path routing. So what's the point of then doing it in, in segment routing? Uh, it's about simplicity, right? Because LDP requires a protocol. If you can use the IGP to distribute that information, then it's, it's one less protocol to worry about. Uh, also, in any network, you'll be doing a combination of things. You'll be doing some shortest path, you'll be doing traffic engineering. I, I, I can't imagine all traffic being traffic engineered. So there'll be a, a bunch of traffic that will actually be you know, just taking the shortest path because that's, that's all you care about. So in this example here, for traffic from PE1 to PE2, um, shortest path routing is very easy, right? So as we discussed, the, what is the semantic of a node set? Semantic of a node set. The route by the shortest path, okay? So if you want to achieve shortest path routing in a segment routed network, it's very simple. We put the SID of the destination PE on the packet. That's it, you just need one SID. And it'll take you to the end. So in general, you can think about it this way. If, if you only have a single SID in your label stack, then it's the shortest path first because that's the semantic of it. It's gonna take you to that. If you, if you have traffic engineering, then you probably have more you know, intermediate points that you've got to go through. Uh, and, and, and so your label stack will be more than one um, SID. So in this case here, um, it, it's, as we saw, it's very simple, right? If you want to get traffic to PE2 with a, with a node SID of 800, then uh, PE2 advertises that to the rest of the network, the build, the uh, label forwarding information base. And essentially the P routers will just be doing a swap from 800 to 800, right? So all the way through the network. So in this case here, as we saw, very simple. P1 wants to set a packet to P2, simple. Just slap on a label of 800. That's it, send it out. It's gonna take the shortest path. So it goes to, right, I'm just gonna build this because it's essentially very simple. It goes to all of the nodes, the swap 800 for 800, gets to P3. P3 does the penultimate hop, hop and sends it out to P2. Um, in this particular network, as I said, all the, all the uh, metrics are identical, they're 10. So the packet could have gone this way, but it also could have gone this way, right? So it's, I'm just showing the, what, one, of the, one of the paths. Now, let's just say that you have enabled ECMP in this network, which is obviously a good thing. Okay. So we've, we've enabled ECMP to support uh, two or more paths. So in this case here, you, you can exercise both of the paths, right? The top path of the network and the bottom part of the network. So what would happen is packets would come into PE1 and they get hashed based on some sort of algorithm, which is typically 
implementation dependent, right? So it'll, it'll uh, output a hash value. And as a result, it will either go the top path or the bottom path. So top path, identical to what we had before, bottom path, yeah. So this is simple stuff. Now, here we, I'd, I'd like to expand the definition of the semantic of a node set. So we said the semantic of a node set is, is, is basically it's an instruction to the to the to the network to route the pack, pack, uh, the packet via the shortest path to the destination. But uh, there there is there's one more uh, sort of element to it. Basically, we we change the semantics so that it is actually routed via an ECMP aware mechanism. So you know you could exercise all the ECMP paths if there is more than one uh, you know equal cost path to that destination. So very simple case. Um, okay. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, another example, which is actually very similar to the to the other one. Um, let's just say we we um, we have this requirement once again, like the previous example, to send traffic down this P two to P uh, or avoid the P two to P three link, right? So we looked at some examples. One of these examples is we 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 just use node sets by themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So put a um, stack that goes 300, 600, 800. So 300 gets us to P2, right? So at P1, it's just doing a continue operation because it hasn't reached that intermediate point, gets to P2, where we pop the 300, we're left with 600. 600 is a pointer to P5. So it gets to P5. And at P5, we pop it, we have a um, active segment of 800. So then it's going to send it to um, P P2. So this is sim similar to the other example. So this is just something you can do with, with node sets by itself. So this is probably nothing new here. Um, the third use case is where you want to do something a bit more complicated. So this is a requirement that we call disjointness. So disjointness is, you know, it, it's a property where, you know, two services or what, no, whatever uh, your, your, your intent to be disjoint does not share any common components, All right? So, so for example, you might want to build two paths that are disjoint. That means the paths do not share the ingress, they do not share any of the transit points, and they do not share the endpoint as well. They're completely disjoint. So uh, from a resiliency perspective, what that means is that the failure of any of the elements along either of the paths does not impact the other path, right? So that's a very important criteria. Now, typically, that is not easy to achieve, right? And it's not easy to achieve in a lot of networks because we do not have the visibility of what is happening on other routers. So in a, in a distributed network, every router is making an independent decision of how to route or, or a packet or how to compute a path to a destination. It has no visibility of what other routers are doing from that perspective. So, you know, this is where segment routing can actually help. So uh, in this example, what we'll, we'll look at is a dual plane architecture. So for I'm sure most of you are familiar with the dual plane architecture. Basically, the intent is that we, you know, this is something that's it's typically used in, in, in uh, core networks. So you have two planes. Uh, and, and so, so your P routers uh, are sitting in two different planes. So a, a P router belongs in only one plane. So you've got one plane of a set of P routers, and you've got another set of uh, P routers that are part of another plane. And then your provider edge routers are connected to both planes. And, and they're configured to send traffic either on one plane or the other plane. And, and the whole idea of this is once again to, to de-risk networks. So if the plane fails, uh, you know, there's, well, there's a hope that both planes do not fail at the same time. Right. So, and, and, and if that's, that's achieved, then you, you, you ensure that at least you know, your traffic continues to flow while you uh, take remediation action on that one plane. So 
the way we can use this, um, or the way we can use segment routing to achieve this is by using any cast segments. So remember, I, I mentioned any cast earlier. Uh, the, the concept of using the same IP address for different nodes, okay, that's any cast, right? Uh, in, in a traditional routing perspective, we can we can extend that to segment routing, where we use the same node set for a bunch of routers that form part of an any cast set. So here's one example. So let me let me take you through how this is constructed. Let me get my pointer. Okay. So we've got we've got two planes here. So you've got this red plane, which is comprised of routers P1, P2, P5, P6, right? And they're connected through these red links. And then you've got a blue plane with P3, P7, P4, and P8. Now we've designated the red plane, uh, or we've configured it with an anycast SID of 902, right? So these nodes, the P1 and P5, will be configured identically with SID 902. Um, and uh, the same for the blue plane, which is configured with a SID of 901. You can see the PE routers are connected to both planes, right? So now what we want to do is be able to somehow influence the plane that is used by any particular traffic. So let's just say this. We want to create a service at PE1 that terminates on PE3. And it actually goes over the red plane. So from a segment routing um, you know, perspective, what we can do is we can put a uh, segment list that is 902 and 300. So what is 902? 902 is, the, is this plane here, right? And 300 is the SID for PE3. So by putting 902 here, you know that P1 will have learned from P1 that its SID is 902. So by putting it there, the traffic will be routed to P1. Once it gets to P1, it'll strip that and they'll start routing the traffic to 300. So once it, the, the point of that 902 is to put it on the red plane. Once it's on the red plane, it's gonna take really the shortest path to PE3, which is through the red plane, because these links will typically have higher cost. The, the, the links between the planes are usually there as a last resort. So you typically do not want traffic crossing the planes. So by doing that, that traffic gets sent that way. And in a similar way, for service two, what you want to do is send it over the blue plane. So you have this stack that looks like this, 901, which gets it into the blue plane, and 400, which is the destination PE, which is um, uh, PE4. Does that make sense? Sure. Sorry, say that again. So the question is, if the link between... If the link between PE1 and P1 is cut, yep, yeah, okay. And P1 and P2 is also down. Yeah, so, okay, so if, 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 if the link between PE1 and P1 is down and P1 and P2 is down. P, P3, sorry. Oh, sorry, say, say that again. So, okay, this one's down. Yes, that one is down and P1 and P3. Is down. Oh, and this one is down as well. Yes. Yes. So then we, we would go to yeah. uh, P1 to P3 and then P3 yeah. P1 to, to P3, P3 and then it'll go to. How would it know that it would connect to? So that? now, okay. So, okay. Good question. So, so the link between P1 and P1 is down. This one's down and that one's down as well. Right. Now, if, if you send it with a um, uh, segment list of 902 and 300, so now the, the shortest way of getting to 902 is this link, right? So we'll send it to P3. And then P3 will say, P, P3 will now find a way to 902. Because you've got 902 
what you're telling the network is get me to the, the red plane as soon as you can. Now, as it happens, yeah, okay, you got some failures. So you'll go through these, this plane until you get onto the red plane. So let's just see how this is going to work. So traffic will go from P1 to P3. Now from P3, this link has failed, right? So you will, you will have to, you will have to cross this, right? At some point, you have to cross this. Um, so you could go this way, this way, and then cross it. Or you could go this way and this way, cross it. So the shortest path here will be P3 to P7, and then P7 to P5, right? So at the earliest point, it'll rejoin the, the red plane. So it's not going to stop. And just one sure. extreme case. No, no, please <laughs> what, go ahead. What, what if the, the plane is separate because of the... The links on down between blue and the red plane, will that cause an issue? Because um, PE one cannot go to the nine or two plane. Oh, so you, you mean all of these plan. links are down? Yes, um, between red and blue. So there's no links there. If it's down at that time, I think you've got a catastrophe there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just uh, out of curiosity. Yeah. I think you have uh, you have bigger problems. <laughs> Yes. So, so my recommendation is make sure that doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> no, no. So, I mean, uh, yeah, look, I mean, you could do things like P1 could be dual home to P1 and P5 as well. Yeah. So, you know, you could do that as well. So there's, there's a few ways you can, you can get around this problem. But yeah, it's, you know, these things do happen. I know. I mean, I know that it's, uh, it, it's, it's a catastrophic failure, uh, but it does happen. So yeah, it, it's good to plan. Well, you can't plan for multiple fa failures, but uh, I, I think that's a scenario you could uh, maybe maybe think about at some point. No, the likelihood is that you might lose it in one city. For example, if this is a city, like this could be on common DWDM or optical network. So it could go down, but for this to go down as well, if it's in a different city, okay, that's, that's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there has to be a physical path. Segment route, routing cannot do anything if there's no physical path. Right, does that make sense? So it, it's an easy way. I think it's a very easy way of you know, steering traffic. Right. Um, yes, sir. Please. What will determine the path that will take within the plane? Like, for example, Blue blue plane. It yeah okay. That, that's a good good question. So it's you know it it it, it depends on your um, RGP uh, design. Like I, I would imagine you'd be using different IGPs potentially, and then you're doing some sort of redistribution or EBGP between the planes, right? So depending on how you've configured that, you could be either using IGP shortest path routing, or some sort of BGP mechanism in order to go between the two. Um, between the two planes. Okay, within the plane? Within the plane, it should be IGP based. Yeah. Hey, any, any other questions? Right, okay, we'll keep moving then. So um, egress peer engineering. So I, I, I mentioned that earlier and, and I'm sure most of you would not have got it because it was an abstract concept. So is an, is, is an example here, uh, where we can um, sort of you know, illustrate the whole concept of egress peer engineering. So what does it actually mean, right? It's, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful when we say BGP egress peer engineering. So essentially what we're saying here is this is a way of uh, providing deterministic engineering of the exit point from an autonomous system, right? Uh, you could be using your BGP um, attributes to do that, right? That's one way of doing it. Um, uh, but there's, there's also a way to do it using segment routing when if you're using seg segment routing in your network, because there could be multiple exit points from a single autonomous system. So that's really what I want to sort of look at here now. Um, so if you recall, I mentioned earlier that th there are three types of 
egress PA engineering segments. Um, and, and until now, we've, we've spoken about IGP segments, node segments and adjacency segments. They were fairly simple. And these aren't that complicated either, right? It's just that this is information that is advertised by BGP. So the first one is a peer node SID. So this is a SID that is associated with a BGP peer node, right? So a SID that identifies a BGP peer. Um, we also have peer adjacency SIDs. So the difference here is, is a little bit more uh, sort of subtle. This is identifying a specific link to a BGP peer. So, you know, think about a multi-hop eBGP peering where you could have multiple links to your BGP peer, but you're still peering with the one BGP peer at the end of it, right? Um, you might have a need to more, more specifically dictate which particular age adjacency you take to get to that peer. So that's where the peer adjacency set comes in. And you've got a peer set set. Now, for whatever reason, you know, you, you might have a number of nodes or BGP peers that you want to treat as a set and be able to load share between all of these endpoints. Uh, so there you use a peer set set. Now, once again, like I said, it, it may not make total sense, but we'll look at an example and it'll, it'll become a lot clearer. So in this case here, we have an autonomous system that has uh, a router R2 and it also has a router R1 that is connected to a couple of other autonomous systems, okay? So R1 um, is connected to AS200 through two peers. There's R7 and R8 in AS200. So you get a peering with the R1 and R7 between R1 and R8. And then you've got two adjacencies, two links to R9. So R1 to R9, two links, and you're running eBGP multi-hop there. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, so in this case here, R1, when you turn on BGP egress peer engineering, will allocate a number of different SIDs. It'll allocate a peer node segment, right, for each of its peers. So R7, R8, and R9, they're all nodes, right? It'll, um, for, for each interface to a multi-hop peer, it will assign a peer adjacency SID. So in this case for R9, you know, there'll be a peer adjacency SID for the top link and, and one for the bottom link as well. And, and if you have configured any peer sets, then it'll assign a SID for the set of peers. So for example, in this network, um, R1 connects to AS200. Uh, it's got links to both R7 and R8. So you could con consider that R7 and R8 are a set of peers. And uh, you want to load share over the links to these peers. So you set up a little set here and say, okay, that's a set that encompasses R7 and R8. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we want to do here is um, be able to do a more granular forwarding of traffic on, on whatever basis, right? Uh, across these links to the different ASs. So, um, we configure BGP egress peer engineering on the router, R1. When you configure it, you'll find that in most implementations, it'll automatically generate these, the peer node SIDs and the peer adjacency SIDs. The peer set SID is something you might have to configure because that's, that, that's more of a configurable um, quantity, right? I mean, it's sort of obvious as to which nodes you wanna be part of a single set. Um, so you do that, it assigns SIDs for all of these things, right? The three types, the peer node, peer adjacency, and peer set SIDs. Now these SIDs are assigned by R1, but we need to get the network to be aware of these SIDs. So how do you do it, right? Um, now, the typical way that this has been implemented is by using a protocol called BGP LS. So is anyone familiar with BGP LS or BGP link state? Anyone uh, familiar with this? 
No, you haven't heard of visual billing state. Okay, so let me let me let me just quickly tell you what what that is. Um, BGP link state is a, a, a set of extensions to BGP that allow the RGP topology of the autonomous system um, to be advertised to something else. And that something else is typically a SDN controller. So remember I said, how does the Ingress PE know what stack to put on it and the answer was using a controller but for a controller to do it it's got to have visibility of the topology how does it get a visibility of the topology the controller is sitting somewhere else right it's not part of your network per se so how does it get visibility of the topology so the way it does it is is by running this extension to bgp called bgp link state so what what bgp link state does is it takes your um OSPF, LSAs, in your, in your ISIs, LSPs, uh, and, and, and translates that into BGP updates. So information on your links and nodes and adjacencies and so on, IP addressing, is put into uh, BGP um, uh, uh, updates and sent to the controller. Now, based on that, the, the controller is able to perform a complete view of the topology of the network. And, and this stuff is kept up to date, right? So there's a topology change. It affects the IGP, which then impacts what it advertises to the controller through BG billing state. So basically the, the thing, what I'm trying to get across here is that the controller has a complete view of your network. It knows what nodes are in the network, which node is connected to what node, what is the IP addressing, what is the metric, or what, what is the TE information. It has a complete view of that. Uh, and it's done through BGPLS. All the PE and the PNOS talking to the correct, yeah. Oh, actually, actually for for BGP link state, we just need one node talking to it, right? Because you know, if if you, if you think about um, yeah, this network here, let's say there's there's many routers here, let's say there's fifty routers here, and and all of the routers are in a single L one ISIS area, right? So they all have the same LSPs, right? By by virtue of the fact that it's a single area. Every node has an identical uh, view of that area. So it just needs one node to communicate that information to the controller. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you would, you would have two yeah. Yeah. In, case, in case it's a failure. And in the case of Surasit, maybe you want more because he usually has catastrophic failures. So <laughs> maybe you have all of them going to it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, Router. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you don't even need to run IBGP peering, because because remember the 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 thing that we're advertising is the IGP information, which is already shared, right? So it doesn't matter whether you pick router one or router two; they all have the same information. Right. If you look at OSPF LSA, it's the same in all the routers. So it doesn't matter. So it, it's very low impact. But it just, yeah, you just pick one, it translates that stuff into BGPLS, sends it to the controller. So this is one of the few, probably the only one that I can think of, a BGP update that is only one way. You, you're sending these updates from the, the network to the, to the controller. It's not the other way, right? Um, so it's purely for information sort of gathering and topology visibility. But if you use IGP, how could uh, like uh, in this case, how could that one know all the all the nodes? The question was if they use the IGP, how will a node know about all the other nodes? Yeah. No, no. It, so this is just IGP information. Right, so not eBGP information. So everything known in your IGP will be shared. Yeah. So what? Sorry, there's another question. Yes. If the. Um, okay. So the question is, what happens if the controller gets disconnected? Yeah, that that's not a good thing. Um, so so typically you would have. <laughs> You guys are too negative, you know. 
Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. So look, look, look. It's it, it's a very good question, right? Um, and in 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 SDN uh, talk, this this always comes up. Uh, you're you're taking something that is distributed, designed to handle failures, and you're centralizing the complexity somewhere. It's a bit scary. So yeah, you will find that most implementations will provide you a geo redundant architecture, right? So if you if you have you no know, failure, it'll uh, some other site will take over. So there are mechanisms built in to ensure that that doesn't happen. Now, also, um, you you want to you want to have such design that even if your um, controller fails, right? Whether you lose connectivity to your controller, well, I think that's easily solved, right? You have redundant connectivity. That's one. But let's say you lose connectivity to your to your controller, you you still want to design your network in such a way that your forwarding plane continues to forward in a headless fashion, right? So until that controller comes back. So just because you lost communication with the controller, you know, it it cannot update your network, but you still want it to, want it to continue using the last known information, right? So you can do stuff like that as well. Well, I mean, hopefully not too long. Yeah, hopefully not too long, yeah. So we, which is why having a redundant controller architecture is very important. And, and, and this is why uh, um, <clears throat> if, if you look at the, the current hybrid SDN model, um, we're not putting everything on the controller. Now, you might be doing some path computation on the controller and stuff like that, but uh, your IGP is still running in a distributed fashion and so on, right? So these, the, the key parts of the network are still really running in a distributed fashion that is able to handle failures and so on. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, where was I? Yeah, okay, so so we, we talked about big PLS. Um, and the fact that it advertises all the IGP information. One, one of the other things I was mentioned about big PLS is the, uh, remember that the IGP uh, link state is, you know, that's within the area only. So let's just say you've got multiple areas. Each of the areas will need to have a BGP speaker talking to big PLS because obviously those LSEs do not cross the area boundaries, right? Uh, so so that, that's one more thing. If you, have, if you have a multi or a hierarchical sort of IGP, then you have to make sure that you've got speakers everywhere. Right, so that this is the way that the, the controller gets visibility of the network, uh, at least the internal IGP topology of the network. Um, now, what we've done is we've extended BGPLS so, so that routers can also advertise the BGP egress peer engineering SIDs to the controller. So let's go back to where we were five minutes ago. R1, you go into R1, you configure BGP EPE. And as part of that, it, it allocates all these BGP EPE SIDs um, and that are associated with specific things. Likes like a node or an adjacency or a set, and then this information is advertised to the controller. So all of these other nodes in the network don't necessarily have visibility of the EP SIDs, but the controller does, right? Uh, you could, of course, you know, we, we could do do this with BGP, make sure everyone gets it as well. That that's that's the other option. Uh, but if you use BGPLS, it goes to the controller. Controller has visibility of it. Now it can do something with that information. So uh, let me, um, so here I've, I've once again got some questions for you guys. Uh, we, we see that on R1, when we turn this on, um, it allocates a number of labels for the BGP EPE purposes. So the 1001 um, has an operation that if Router one receives a packet where the active segment is 1001. It's going to pop it and it'll send the packet to R7. 1002, it sends it on the link to R8. 1003, it sends it on the upper link to R9. 1004, it sends it on the lower link to R9. 1005 is interesting. It load balances, balances on any link to R9. And 1006, it load balances on any link to R7 or R8. 
So now that you guys are experts in uh, BGP EPE, can you tell me what these SIDs are? As in, is it peer node, peer adjacency, or peer set? Let's start with 1001. What do you think it is? Peer node? Okay. Anyone else uh, got any? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just. Peer node or peer adjacency. Okay. Anyone else? Both at the same time. Yeah. But the more specific, the more specific one is the is the link. But but really it's a peer node set because there's only one link to it. So that's actually a peer node set. Okay, so 1002, that should be easy. Is that peer node or peer set or peer adjacency? All right, okay, good. How about 1003? Peer adjacency set, right. How about this? Okay. How about uh, 1005? It says load balance on any link to R9. Is it peer set? Peer node. Yeah, it's actually peer node. Yeah, because now, now if you send any 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 traffic to 1005, it, it says load balance on any link to R9. So it's destined for R9. It'll take any of the links, right? It'll hash across these links. So you get some sort of load sharing happening that way. How about 1006? Peer set. Yeah, absolutely. It's peer set. Well, what's it doing? What's 1006 doing? It says right there. <laughs> okay, essentially, it's essentially you know think of it as a as, as a set that uh, that is as your traffic that is sent to AS two hundred, right? So it'll, it'll, it'll balance over R seven or R eight. Okay, cool, cool, cool. cool. Um, okay, so what can we what can we do with this? Right, what smart things can we do with this? So let's just say, um, you know. What we want is, remember, why are we doing this? We're doing this to pick an exit point out of your autonomous system. So traffic comes into R2, and you want to pick, you know, and it's, it's going through R1, right? Let's just say you've got one exit point in your network, which is R1. But R1's got connectivity to R7 and R8 in AS200, and it's got two links to R9 in AS300. So it could go take any of these paths, right? Uh, if, if, if left to its own devices. But we want to have a bit more control. So what we want to do is we want to program some policy in R2 to dictate where the traffic goes. Uh, and, and one other bit of information that is important here is the node set for R1. Now, is that an IGP segment or is it a BGP segment, the node set for R1? IGP, yeah. Because that's going to be used internally within the AS to get traffic from R2 to R1. So here's what we could do. You could have some a policy that says 80% of the traffic that goes to AS300 has to have this segment list. All right? Or 100, 1005. So on, on R2, we'll have some way of hashing that traffic so that you know 80% of that is sent with a segment list of 100, 1005. So what happens is 100 gets you to R1. When you get to R1, looks at 1005, which says pop and load balance on any, any link to R9. All right, so get load balanced over the links. And it says 20% traffic has to be sent to AS200 with segment list 100, 1006. So that'll be sent to R1. Uh, that 100 gets it to R1, 1006, which says you know, use the PS set, which means it has to, has to hash and load share the traffic between R7 and R8 to AS200. And you can have many other sort of things, right? You can say specific prefixes, send it with a certain segment list and so on. So it's really, it is like policy-based routing, but it's policy-based routing on steroids because you want to do more with it, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is, but I mean, you, you're... The, the, the added element here is you've got a controller. So you, you, you can have, now, now think about this. Now think about the possibilities of this. You're, you have a controller that has visibility of the network. So you can start doing some smart things. 
your, your controller can now have visibility of dynamic state. How much traffic am I running on this interface? Uh, you know, what is the CPU load of a router? And based on that, it can, it can push down policies that make the best use of the network, right? You might have, you know, how many of us have operated networks where traffic is imbalanced? You've got plenty of traffic on one side and very little on the other side, right? It happens all the time. I mean, we, we, that kind of, that's, a, that's a daily thing for us. If you can, if you can you know, delegate that responsibility to a controller, it can do it in a dynamic fashion and ensure that you get better utilization of your network. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, that's a good example. So, so, the, so the question here is, you know, how, how can we, so you've got a scenario where you've got, um, let's say, two sides of a network, and you've got too much traffic going down one side, and, and typically the way you're doing it is you, you whatever, craft some sort of policy, um, reduce the number of prefixes going over a certain link onto the other one to balance the traffic, right? How can a controller help? So the controller can definitely help. Right. So, so firstly, what you want is your controller to be able to be monitoring the, the, the utilization of these links. Right. So you, so you, you set this up so the controller uh, measures the, the, the utilization and, and maybe it's got something like a threshold crossing alert or something that says, okay, I hit 70%, take some action. And, and, and then what it can do is um, this is just one sort of you know, off the top of my head kind of thing. Um, uh, you, you can uh, collect some CFLOW D stats or something, right? IP fix on a st stats to see the, um, the the traffic that is going over the, uh, the the congested link, and and based on that you work out who are your top talkers that are using this link. Uh, so what then the what the controller can then do is then move some of this gradually onto the other link automatically, right? That's the that's really the benefit of this, where you can actually tie in a lot of very sort of different concepts together, but automate this whole process. Yeah. 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 So, so the question is, uh, does the, the controller need more information? Yes, absolutely. So the, you, you need you need some way of pulling stats from your network. Uh, so you could be running streaming telemetry, you know, um, and you know, subscribing to uh, what's what's happening on um, uh, on your links uh, and working out link utilization as a result of that. So you can do all of that. Yeah. So so you can see this is this is very powerful, right? These are the these are the um, basic building blocks um, that you can use in order to automate uh, a lot of what happens in your network. Okay. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the next example, which is uh, adjacency segment uh, load balancing. So a uh, simple example here, you've got, okay, two P routers, traffic from node PE1 to PE2. Um, now, typically, when you have this kind of a network where, let's just say, the, uh, the there's two links between P1 and P2, right? One's a 10 gig link, the other one's a 40 gig link. And if, if you, uh, you know, if, if you uh, configure the metrics based on link capacity, then traffic between P1 and P2 would always use the 40 gig link, right? There would, would not be any traffic going over the 10 gig link, assuming that, you know, they, they're separate IP interfaces and so on, because that's the shorter path. So you would not, you know, you, you'd end up with a situation where um, basically uh, that 10 gig link, it's just being wasted. So let's just say we, we did um, a shortest path routing. So we put a node set for P2 on the packet, goes to P1, it swaps and sends it down the lower link. Okay, so these are IP interfaces, okay. Um, goes to P2, pops the 800, does a uh, PHP, sends it to P2. So the, the outcome of that, of that is that in this environment, you're not doing any load sharing or load balancing over the P1 to P2 links because they are unequal cost. And your 
um, you know, your forwarding is, is picking the shortest path, which does not include that lower capacity link. So a very simple solution to that is to use adjacency segments. So um, with the adjacency SID TLV that is, uh, you know, advertised as part of the IGP, you've got a way of associating a weight with the different links that are part um, of that adjacency. So for example, in that same network, what we can do here is we can um, advertise for the links between P1 and P2. We can advertise an adjacency SID specifically for the 10 gig link, right? This is 1001. We can also advertise a adjacency SID for the 40 gig link with a SID value of 1002, right? But it has a weight of four. Um, we also advertise a third adjacency SID. And here we construct an adjacency set. So this is like the peer set SID, right? Now this adjacency set actually has a SID value of 1003. So think of it this way. The SID value of 1001 is specifically for the 10 gig link. SID value of 1002 is specifically for the 40 gig link. And the SID value of 1003 includes the links, includes both the links. It's a bundle across the two links. Okay. So here's what it looks like on P1. Anything received with um, an adjacency SID value of 1001, right? Um, oh, sorry. Anything received with a, with a SID value of 1003 will be distributed across the 10 gig link as well as the 40 gig link. And it's gonna be distributed in a one to four fashion because the, the 10 gig link has a weight of one and 40 gig link, link has a weight of four. That means for every packet it sends on the 10 gig link, it'll send four packets on the 40 gig link. Okay, so you're getting that load sharing happening there. So now let's just say P1 pushes a segment list 200, which will get it to P1, right? That's a node set for P1. Um, it then has a adjacency set of 1003, which says load balance over the two adjacencies in a one to four ratio. And then it's got a, a set of 800, which is your, your ultimate destination. So now that's what happens gets to P1, it pops 200, 1003, sends the traffic, whoops, to P2. And it'll be, some will get sent over the 10 gig link, some will get sent over the 40 gig link, but you end up using both, both the links. So it's, it's one very simple example of how you can use an adjacency SID um, to, to, to get better, better utilization out of your network. Okay, so yes. For the, sorry? Can, can we use the for the PSN, it depends on implementation. Yes, there's, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the, the there's, there's one use case here where we, you know, uh, the, the, some, some, some operators have a requirement where they want to use the standard CSPF that they use for RSVPTE. So with, with RSVPTE, I don't know, most of you have weren't, weren't very familiar with RSVPTE, but, but the way we, we uh, do path calculation for RSVPTE is by using what we call CSPF or a constrained shortest path, path first algorithm. And, and essentially what we do with that is, you know, we, we're still building a shortest path first, but we're pruning certain links or nodes from that shortest path first tree to meet certain requirements. So for example, you could say that, you know, I, I want to build a, a tree that only has links that are 100 gigs or more. So what you would do is, you know, your, your Dijkstra algorithm uh, would be run on a pruned tree that has gotten rid of all the links that are less than 100 gigs. And so your calculation is then running on that 100 gig link. So it's, you know, typically in RSVTE, that's how we do it. Uh, because the algorithm runs on the router. 
right? We, we, we typically haven't used controllers, right, in the RSBT days. So it had to be done in a distributed fashion. Uh, and, and it had to be done using whatever information we had at our disposal, which, which was really uh, everything that was advertised by the IGP. So if you have a requirement to do some traffic engineering, uh, but you, you know, but RSVTE doesn't really scale for your need and you don't really want to invest in a controller, you can actually use the same mechanism. You can use CSPF to calculate segment routing uh, traffic engineer tunnels. They use the same algorithm. And, and, and in this kind of an environment, you don't need a controller, right? You can use the same kind of thing uh, where, um, whoops, let me see. Um, your, 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 your routers are calculating this on a in a distributed way. So for example, let's, 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 let's look at a very simple example. Um, I just need some water. So sorry, give me a second. Go. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is, um, if you look at this uh, uh, topology here, we've created what we call a shared risk link group. Now, it's basically, you know, let's just think of it as a, as a set of resources that share the same fate. Now, what does it mean? Um, you might have a bunch of uh, IP links that are created over an optical network, right? For example. Um, and they just happen to share the same duct, right? So they are in the same duct. You, you normally don't have that information available at the IP layer, right? But let's just say you coordinate with your optical team and they tell you, hey, you know what? Links one, three, and five share the same optical path. They're in the same ducts and so on. So they will share fate. If that fiber gets cut, right? All of these links will be down. So you put them in a, in a shared risk link group. And, and then you've got, say, your links two, four, and six, which are in a completely different fiber bundle, right? Over a different duct and so on. You put them in another shared risk link group. So think about this scenario. Let's just say you've got two routers that are you know, sitting between two, two states or cities. Uh, and one is connected with link number one, or, or one link is link one that connects router A and B, and another link is link three that connects routers C and D. And you might think, hey, I've got diverse infrastructure. I've got two different routers. I've got two different links. But the fiber gets cut or the duct gets you know, damaged. Both of them go down. In fact, that's your situation, Sarah said, between your uh, dual plane cores. So it could happen. Um, so all of these links go down. So that's a challenge. So what you can do is with, with some of these constraints, you, you can get that information from that optical uh, layer and say, hey, these links are part of the same shared risk link group. I do not want, you know, if, if I'm building two links, I want them to be in two different shared risk link groups so that they do not share fate. So in this example here, it's not strictly speaking to do with that, but let's just say we've got a shared risk link group between P1 and P2. So this information can be flooded into um, OSPF and ISIS, right? Now it's part of our traffic engineering information. So what we wanna do is this. We wanna compute a path from P1 to P2. And for this particular path, we want to avoid the shared risk link group one. All right, that's your IGP topology. It says, that's great, but I do not want to use this path, right? This path. So what we do is we run this CSPF, for constraints shortest path first calculation on P1 that finds a path to P2 that does not include the P1 to P2 link. Now, this is a very simple network. 
So I think all of us know what the path is. There is no suspense here. It's going to be this path, right? It's, it's, it's going to go this way. So this is one way of doing it, right? Now that we've done that, um, sorry, let me just say this. So P1 does the constraint shortest path first, runs the dice algorithm, and it comes up with this list of nodes, P1, P3, P4, P2, P2, right? So then it becomes very easy for PE1 to work out what segment list it puts on packets. The segment list is like this, in the worst case, 200, 500, 600, 300, 800. But we can optimize it, right? Can we make it better? Don't look at this. <laughs> I, sh I should have animated this. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So we could, we could we, instead of doing 200, 500, 600, 300, 800, we can just do 500, 600, 800. So do you know why that works, right? Because this link is not down. Remember, this link is not down, which is avoiding it. So if you do put 500 there, shortest path in P1 and P3 is P1, P3, which is what you want. And then you put 600. You, you can't put 300. You cannot, because the traffic could go this way. So you put 600 to make sure it goes to the next hop. And then you put 800 because that's going to be the shortest path, right? So that's one of its way of achieving it. Now, why do we do, why do we do all this? Like, you know, why, why do I bother with optimizing? Uh, is it because I enjoy this? Well, I mean, it's fun, but it's not that fun. Um, no, we do it because there is a, a potential constraint here. Different bits of hardware will have limits on what we call the maximum segment depth. Right. So if you look at this segment, it's got a depth of five. You've got five SIDs in there. Um, and, and that could be a problem for some silicon out there. So, so uh, th th there are things that we call SID uh, or you know, segment list compression algorithms that compress it down by using the, the fact that the semantic of the node is to take the shortest path. So for parts of the network where we're going to take the shortest path anyway, why have all that extra stuff in there, right? Like if you look at this 200, 500, 600, 300, uh, 800, then you know, we don't need 200 because it's the shortest path to 500 will go through that anyway. There's no choice. It's going to go through it. And then we skipped, well, we need 600, like I said, because otherwise it could go that way. And then we go 800. We skipped this 300 because for 600, for traffic from 600, to, oh, sorry, for traffic from P4 to get a P2, that's going to be the shortest path anyway. So we exploit that and, and optimize it. Now, if you've got a good, if, if you've got a good controller, it'll do it for you, right? It's not like you have to sit there and, and, and employ someone to work out the shortest path. That would defeat the purpose of this. So um, just a question. Yes. So it's computing the optimal path and the voice to this. What happens to the thing that has the risk? It's unused, and used as a backup. For, for this particular traffic. Yeah, so you could have some other traffic that it's okay for you to put on there. Right. Remember, that's the beauty of segment routing. You don't do this for all traffic. You, you will have some policy at P1 that says, for my good traffic, for my voice traffic. traffic. Yeah, yeah. And for all my, you know, my YouTube traffic, for example, or things you don't care about too much if it failed. Uh, Netflix, maybe not. Yeah, maybe Netflix, Netflix is important. Um, so, you know, depending on that, you, you, could, you could craft a policy that, that, that puts it you know, over the right link. Okay. Yes. No, uh, it, it depends on the implementation. So you have to talk to your router vendor. And will, yeah, actually, so there will be a recommended depth because uh, beyond that, you might have um, you might have to do a reflow. And what a reflow is is to send a packet multiple times through the through the forwarding path. A reflow is are not generally good because you end up losing throughput. So it depends on a silicon. Yeah. So I suggest you, you talk to your vendor about that. Okay. So look, we've, we've got 10 minutes left and uh, I've just done half the deck here. So um, what, what I might do now is, is really take you through the rest of it just to give you some pointers on what to, what to look out for. Uh, and, and then we'll wrap up there. Uh, like I said, you're going to have all the slides 
Uh, but if, if you do have any specific questions, uh, I'm going to be around till till Friday. So I'm, I'm more than happy to sit down with you and discuss that. Or if you have some specific requirements for your network, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that as well. So let me let me quickly go through some of these use cases, um, not in detail, like I said, but just to give you an overview of what is there. Uh, use case seven is about seamless MPLS. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with seamless MPLS, like I said earlier, it's it's a hierarchical construct. You know, um, it, it's much like in a way, it's well, it's not exactly like it, but you know how we have hierarchical IGPs and you split a big domain into areas and so on. Right, it's it's kind of doing that at the MPLS layer. So you're creating these smaller sort of islands of MPLS, and then interconnecting all of it through BGP, which obviously scales a lot better. So operators have been doing this for a long time, uh, very much used in the uh, you know, in in the uh, market for 10, 15 years now. So very mature. Uh, we've been doing it with LDP and RGBTE. You can do the same with segment graph. So this is. Uh, some sort of a network where you can do this, where you're running different protocols in each cloud. The cloud could be an IGP instance, it could be an IGP area, right? And then you, you, you're kind of um, stitching everything together with BGP. So that's one there. Um, this is an interesting use case. Use case number eight is about using controller. Uh, so if you look, I mean, this whole different steps, so you can actually step through it and see how that works. Um, that's an example that shows how we create um, diverse services. So, you know, this is once again a disjoint service. So you want a service from P1 to P3 and one from P2 to P4. They're using uh, different paths. And you can see that there are there's no commonality. There are no common elements between these um, services. So how can you use a controller to achieve that is, is here. Uh, global bandwidth optimization. Okay, so this is this is one challenge. I think you mentioned that as well, right? It's uh, in a, in a network uh, running RSVPT or even one that's not running any kind of MPLS. You, you typically end up with a situation where you've at least in in an MPLS network you have lots of LSPs um, over different links between different endpoints, and you might have a situation where over time it's 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 kind of panned out that you've got an uneven distribution of traffic, right? So by using this uh, global bandwidth optimization, what you can do is run algorithms on your controller that allow you to, to basically reroute these, these LSPs in an intelligent fashion so they get better utilization of your network. So that's that use case. Okay, and then the final section was, was around deployment options. Uh, so like I said, I'll, I'll leave that uh, for you to to have a look at, but but very quickly, you know the, the two environments. Firstly, uh, you know, what we call obviously greenfields environments, where you're building a brand new network. Not many people do that, or are lucky enough to do that. Uh, most of us are stuck with brownfield networks, so existing networks, and um, have to deal with legacy. So uh, these the, there are some techniques where you can um, uh, interoperate with what's in your network. It's 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 simply ships in the night routing. So if you're running LDP or SBTE, or you're, you're, you're able to then run segment routing together with it as well. Um, segment routing LDP, uh, some, most of you are familiar with LDP here, right? Um, they, there's, there's many ways of skinning this cat, right? Uh, you run both of them. Like in this network here, we see some uh, mo all of the nodes run LDP and a subset of them run segment routing and, as well as LDP. And, and so you know, depending on which nodes you're going between, you use either SR, or use LDP. Um, so yeah, it's a bit more detail there. Now migration from LDP to segment routing. There's many different ways, ways of doing it. So I've, I've got a whole bunch of steps here where you start from an LDP only environment and then you introduce segment routing and start using it for some services uh, and then gradually migrate services so that you know it's all segment routing, right? So there's, there's many ways of doing it. It's a very seamless way of doing it. You know, I imagine a lot of operators will continue to use both of them for a very long time. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, there isn't that much benefit of migrating, but there's a lot of benefit in coexisting with it. So there's, there's stuff in here uh, to do with that. Um, 
look, if, if you have this situation where you've got a mix of SR only and LDP only routers, uh, I feel for you. <laughs> Try not to get into the situation, but if you, if you do, uh, there are some options here. So there, there's a thing called an SR mapping server that, that helps us to interwork between parts of the network that are segment routing only and those that are LDP only, right? Um, so you can do that. Um, this is a bit more complex. I, I, you know, each of these slides could take 20 minutes to go through, but have, have a look at it. Um, ping me if you have any questions. We can use segment routing to provide LDP fast reroute. You know, I mentioned that uh, fast routing LDP can be a bit complicated. Segment routing is a good way of, uh, you know, um, plugging some of those gaps. So that's that scenario here. Definitely a very complex example, this one here, and especially the second one. And then the final section, all the IGP extensions for segment routing will help if, you, if you're doing packet captures and uh, having, having issues with it. So we might uh, conclude here. Um, so very quick recap, we, we, we looked at some of the drivers for segment routing, right? Um, the, the desire to do fine-grained traffic engineering, some of the limitations that we have with LDP and RSVTE. We looked at the different, um, well, we, look, we, we looked at the fact that there's, there's two ways of achieving this with segment routing. We can use an MPLS, a data plane, or we can use a SR, or oh, sorry, an IPv6 data plane. We looked at the um, MPLS data plane for our examples. We looked at a number of different um, examples with node SIDs, with adjacency SIDs, with BGP, um, EPE SIDs, and so on, and, and how we can do traffic engineering. So I hope that was uh, useful. Um, does anyone have any sort of final questions before we wrap up? Uh, is there an open source deployment on this? An open source environment of what? Segment routing? Yeah, there, there are some information out there. Yeah. yeah. Open source routers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Definitely some some open source uh, implementations out there, which you can use to have play with here. Sorry, what's, what's the most compelling reason to enable segment routing? Sorry. What's, what's Traffic engineering, traffic engineering is skill. Yeah, or uh, it, it could be that it could be that you're running errors with DE and running into issues with scaling that. Yeah. Scaling. Yeah, sc scaling is the main thing here, right? But by, by removing that endpoint state, it, it gives you better capabilities. That example of uh, uneven sort of you know, loading of links, which they're doing manually, right? So that can be automated using this infrastructure as well. Okay. That might be it. So thank you very much. Uh, hope uh, you found that of some value. Thank you. That's it. There's no break. Hey. I'm sorry. The next session starts with six o'clock uh, with the BOF, Barry.
Never know who you're going to get. <laughs> what do you guys? Equinix. You all oh, Equinix? We're missing Equinix in the You got factories. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> DJ. Uh, DJ, yeah. Oh, DJ, Harry says, you guys need it. Point out. Uh, more people in other communities. So I'm going to actually, let's get started. Um, let's not wait. It's six. People have been here all day. <laughs> and now we get to a boss session at the end of the day, right, about security work, right? Um, but those who have their laptops in front of them, there's a tiny URL, right? You can sign up to that because I didn't know how this session was set up, but I was thinking with the rooms. Originally with the program committee, people said, hey, why don't we bring the tables together, you know, and talk to each other instead of being like, like this, we're all spread out. Because in a boss session, we want to be talking to each other, sharing with each other, right? Exploring what is on each of our minds, what's going on, our big security problems, right? So, um, so my name, I'm Barry Green. Um, I've been around Apricot since Apricot 1. Okay, so <laughs> been around for quite a long time. And even before Apricot, I've been around working on internet work since the mid 1980s. So this is who I am. Now, my suggestion is, that's my name. That's my email address. Go to LinkedIn, connect to, connect to me, right? Because part of what you're seeing here in Apricot community, it's all about the community connecting up, right? So. Um, do do that and then just pop me a quick message and say, hey, you know, materials, things like that. You can see all the work I do. I do a lot of stuff online to empower, to share. Um, a lot of what you see with the spirit, you know, was started with uh, Philip Smith and I and others out there in their, you know, mid 90s teaching, trying to teach everybody. You know, if you went to Sunday's uh, APIX session, Right. It was the days where there was no exchange points in, in Asia. Right. And to see like, a, a, a you know, all the participants from all over here is fantastic. So what we're going to do right now, what I planned on doing is try to get where we can all uh, collaborate and kind of like, you know, basically, you know, find out what's on the top of your mind. You know, let me put this in slideshow mode 
so I can see. All right. In other words, what are the key, what's the key security things, right? And we kind of use this for two things. One, so we can have a conversation with each other, right? So I think what we'll do to, to start this out, since we don't have everybody online, we'll just pass the mic around and introduce and, and, and see what's top of top of your mind, right? And then, um, and then you know, take taking the notes so we can kind of see what is, um, what materials that we need to do in the apricot uh, program committee for like our next sessions to help you, right? Are we hitting the right topics, right? Because program committee will get people submit sessions, and the program committee will take a best guess. But you never know if we're hitting the right things, like what you guys need and what you need and what everybody kind of kind of needs in in the in the you know you know are we are we hitting the target right? That's the the key thing with it. So what we'll do, my big thing. So what we're going to do is first question. We're going to pass it around. You can introduce yourself because this is kind of what a boff is. We talk to each other, not not present. Um, what's the top concerns, all right, and things like that. So my, just to secure from me, my big top security concern that I have today is we have a lot of systems that um, we just don't have time to do the hygiene on, you know, this is Akamai, Equinix, things like that. Um, and it is, um, you know, there is a persistent, you know, criminal, I call them miscreants, some people say, well, that's too complicated a word for English, a secular language, but you got bad people out there who are out there breaking in and doing things in networks, and they'll find these systems that haven't been maintained for a while, and if they poke at it, boom, you have big damage. All right, so that's my big concern. That's the stuff I work on in Akamai. So let's kind of start uh, over here, and we'll kind of work work through, just in introduce yourself, and um, he's going like, Surprise! <laughs> yeah, introduce yourself and just what's your big concern, security concern? What's the big, big top thing you're worried about? So if you just introduce yourself and say, uh, Hi, um, I'm Richard, by the way, I'm, uh, from uh, Research um, Education Advanced Network New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, because I work in the network space, security, meaning routing security, that's my the main concern, really. So we're now trying to avoid RPKI. Was just making sure that you know they are signed, especially our downstream, so that you know they they don't get hijacked. So those are primarily the concern that I have at the top of my head at the moment. So BGP hijacking, that's the concern. All right. So what I'm going to do as we do this, I'm going to still yeah. capture my name things. Is, uh, Mira Han. I'm from Thailand, uh, Asian Institute of Technology. Uh huh. Uh, my concern is the firewall uh, and uh, EDOS attack. And all the miscellaneous uh, malware. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> You've already got one. Okay, I'll, I'll start first. Uh, hi, I'm Mark from Equinix, Singapore. So, my top security, security or Worry will be the same with the first guy, uh, route leaks. Hi, I'm Paul, also from Equinix. Um, uh, it's the same as the second guy, which is malware. Hi, I'm Alma from Equinix. Um, more on routing and security because I'm from routing and switching team from Equinix. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Browning. Uh, I'm from uh, Lightwire, which is an ISP in New Zealand, and I also represent uh, NZIX, which is an exchange in New Zealand. Uh, and I guess my number one concern is uh, finding uh, out about current threats before they're on my network. Because, um, yeah, sometimes these things come up on the internet, other people know they're there. How do I know they're there before? That are right there. Hi, my name is Carl. I'm from the University of Guam. Um, I'm part of the security team. I guess my biggest concern being from a 
educational research facility is uh, how to shape the organization to be more aware about cybersecurity risks, especially in a growing BYOD environment. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm from IIJ Research Lab. Um, I don't know if I've got a main security <laughs> um, thing. I, I was just meaning popping and to uh, learn. Um, I mainly do work with automation and stuff. So I guess my main thing would be how easily misconfigurations can cause into security problems. Hi, my name's Warren. I'm from APNIC. I'm one of the trainers there. My concern is probably the uh, holistic. It's referring to the data, the data that we keep. Why do the organisations keep the data? And how long they keep the data and the right to be forgotten and privacy. So if you don't need the data, you shouldn't have it on your network. Therefore, you don't have to protect it. So everyone's saying about routing security and things like that. If you dropped all the, the routes that you don't need to know, you're not going to share it with anyone, so you won't do route leaks. Yeah. And, and the other thing is basically everyone, I don't know a better way to pronounce it, but stupidity. There's a lot of stupid things out there. From a security point of view, people use their mobile phones to do banking, but they don't have any security on their mobile phones. That's stupid. Uh, I'm Kanchana, Kanchana Sud from Asian Institute of Technology. Just would like to observe this, Bob. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So you can see, see like with this, because um, I put the link in there, so you guys can look at the link later and I'll update the slides with it. Um, I, I've been using this Jamboard. Anybody use Jamboard before? Right, cool tool, free from Google, right? You can do all sorts of different interesting things. I use it for brainstorming and classes and things like that with it. So yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of discoveries with it. You can see there's lots of tutorials and how you can do things. It's collaborative. It got very popular during COVID with people. You don't have a whiteboard, so you can do a gym board, right? That's the idea around it. And for doing something like this, it's really good. Like if you don't have a, you know, write notes, put it onto a, a whiteboard, right? We can collect different people's ideas on there, right? So uh, so we don't 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 lose them, right? And you can then move it around and do things like that with it. So you can see it's it's um you know routing security, right, is interesting. But one of the things I noticed with here, we talk so much about RPKI, right? So here's a here's a thought that um uh, on a missing gap. We talk so much about RPKI. We talked about route hijacks, but um I find that most networks who are concerned about it, they get the roars signed and things like that, and they don't set up any monitoring, right? And they don't, and they, they don't set up the basics. Let's deploy a new router. Hey, here's a new router deployed. Oh, let me poke at point 179. Boom, BGCB session goes down, right? Do I do TTL security, the general purpose TTL security? Nope, take the session down. Right, is um, one of the things I'm finding as as you know, the gap. It's like we focus so much on our PKI. To me, our PKI is not necessarily the good, the, the best if you're not teaching all the route and security basics. In other words, here's like you know five six slides. Here's the basics. Make sure you got these done. This is the rhythm and the habit, and then work on the next part. Right with it, because I see that <laughs> I've seen that you guys network, see the my network. Right. In our network, we use uh, the shadow server data set because shadow server will go out there. They're going to actually do a brand new report on 179. Let's scan the internet, all the open 179 ports. <laughs> Very dangerous. Um, so malware was talking about a couple of couple of times with it. Um, who here has seen the CERT New Zealand malware? Um, 
a topology map. No, not even done in New Zealand. You guys in New Zealand? Huh. Here, um, I'll pop this up since I got it on the screen here. Because I, I find this is a pretty powerful um, um, tool. It's also a ransom ransomware. No, nope, not that one. That's the CISA one. I want the CERT one. Yeah. Yeah, because it's kind of like related together with it. Common threats. And where's my ransomware? This my my screen here has the uh, so this guy right here, right? Need full diagram. Let's do bigger screen. There we go. So this this is actually in Akamai. We actually um, and we kind of asked the Cert NZ team, "Hey, can we use this?" And it's interesting that we have so many guides out there. I don't know if people have seen this, but like like the mat miter attack. Anybody here ever tried to use the miter attack? Do you find it usable? <laughs> I don't. That was part of the creation of it. <laughs> Because it evolved from the X805 work from the ITU and then the stuff going into um, I, um, ISO and uh, and that came out of the, there was a Cisco model and then one of the people behind it over a miter was part of my team with it and it just gets so complicated for like a normal person to kind of think what do I need to do what's my action point right and this this is part of the action point. And it's interesting talking to the authors behind us, they say, well, really what we need is a guide to understand the guides. Because <laughs> there's so many of these security topology stuff so you get a guide to understand the guides. So we walk through this. Now you apply this to like what we do in operations operators and like what you talk about with data and things like that. This is a useful sort of exercise tool so people can go through and say, how's it all relate? Because there's a, there's a vector in here. What do I need to do if I take the actions? Like how, if I got everybody working remote on my network, right? Then what are the things I need to do with it? So um, this is something I'll put, I'll put it, put in a note so people can kind of see it. I find it very useful also to communicate up, up to executives. Here's what we need to do. If I, if I show executives, you know, senior vice president, here's a miter attack. They'll nod their head like, yeah, of course I know that. Of course I understand that. <laughs> they won't. But if you do this, they go like, oh, here's my box. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? They'll start asking the questions. What are we doing on each of these things? Simplifies it. So um, this is kind of like, you know, I was thinking about getting the uh, Cert NZ to come up next year for Apricot and do a workshop on ransomware for service providers using a guide like this. Simplify it. Um, so that's a, a comment on the ransomware part. Um, next, I think the next thing is maybe this is go around what questions you want to ask each other, right? So next question to go around is, you know, let's start here. What would you like to ask from everybody here of what you would like to find out right now? What's you hear? This is day three of Apricot, right? It's assuming that you were here on Sunday, what would you like to find out security wise? Uh, maybe for me, uh, which uh, topic you find the most interesting you've attended? Which so, topic you find most interesting? Yes, like for, for each and one of them. In, uh, in apricot? Or yeah, apricot. 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 Oh, what, would it, what do you find most interesting? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, what do you find most interesting so far? Yeah. RPK. <laughs> oh, let's go around. Uh, for me, uh, how... How do you prevent uh, uh, attacks from your networks? 
from your networks uh, for their from their networks towards their networks that so your network to other people's networks no from the outside from the outside coming so, in yeah coming uh, in. like ddos attacks or ransomware which 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 or both both <laughs> <laughs> um there there is there is that well one question how many people here in their organization gets the shadow server reports shadow server reports right oh to shadow server or to the Right. Ah, so somebody probably updated the the, the um, prefix. Ah. ah ask, ask that. So let's let's give everybody a quick context on Shadow Server real quick. Because this is kind of like um, and this is I put the shadow server on. I was shadow server volunteer. Uh we got a lot of uh shadow server volunteers out there. Um Oh, I actually got this session open. Go away, screen stop. So, um, Shadow Server has been around for 17 years now. It is a um, view it as a cyber civil defense sort of organization. And to think of it, what they do is a good illustration of it right here. What what they do is I don't want to do that one. I want that. Is that you have a global capacity in data centers in like several different parts of the world where every day, twice a day, they scan all IPv4 address space. So all IPv4 address space is scanned. Um, IPv6 is scanned selectively. In other words, if you put your, your V6 into the updates, say, please do this, they scan your V6. They scan critical infrastructure V6 that people put in. Um, national cert teams put in, here's V6. So people say you can't scan V6, Yes, it's really big, but you can do selective. Um, all your zones are captured so from a DNS perspective. And that's important because what you get from the report is not a attack surface. You get that. Not a malware sample. You get that. It's like a combination of all of it, not a sinkhole. So if you look at any sort of like uh, Europol takes down a botnet. Microsoft takes down a botnet. You know, any of this stuff in the news where malware is taken down, okay? The long-term home is shadow server. So Microsoft will do a takedown operation. They say, here's command and control. They'll take it down, all right? And then that will be like first couple of months. And Microsoft will say, hey, shadow server, it's time to migrate. And they move it over the shadow server. Why? Because... If your, if your system, if you have something on your network that, that is in that botnet, shadow server then reports it to the networks. So you get it as part of your report. Here's a computer in your network that's infected, all right? So you get that report, all right? Um, and then if it's a domain name that is used, it goes to the registry of last resort. So the registry of last, uh, registrar of last resort, okay? is um, I can certified um, view it as, remember the first Ghostbusters? Anybody go first Ghostbusters movie? They type the ghost and they put it into this uh, ectral spectral containment thing, right? And they put all in there, right? And you pull the screen and all the ghosts come out. That's the registry of last resort. It's all the bad domain names out there that you don't want to go back out because they're linked to some piece of malware right? Um, they have this huge sinkhole system, right? So understanding and seeing where the DDoS attacks are. So all these come together and they get updated to you 
because it used to be like, you can, can get email reports, but most people now they use APIs. Like in Akamai, we use APIs. So we got a tool that we built and it connects up to all Akamai and all of Linode. And we go out there and we pull down and we run scripts against it. And there's so much information that could go to get fixed from our side because we got Linode. And, you know, when Lenovo was purchased, the, 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 the executives in the company said, this is great. We're going to be a cloud company. And all the security people in Akamai says, this is great. It's the number two hosting facility for all the bad stuff. Right. So uh, we get to go uh, clean, clean that stuff up, you know, from a security standpoint. So this is shadow server. You know, you can, um, you know, you get every, all the reports are set up with it. Right. You know, and you do things like I did a class where uh, this was actually, I took a, a report at the time I did this uh, last year from, uh, uh, from Akamai itself. Right. So you take something like open sim uh, simple network management. Right. If you got a network device, and SNMP is opened, Calnet's probably open, SSH is probably open, a whole bunch of other things are prob probably open, right? Now, from a compliance standpoint, like, it, are you compliant? Like what you were asking, looking for the stuff ahead of time with Shadow Server, you know, this is a, a tool that we go out there and say, okay, if, if this is open, then that rack needs to be looked at, right? And if we see a, if we see a particular rack, you know, this is kind of like what we call a region, you say you got as router, you got switched and you got a whole bunch of servers and you see a couple of violations on it, then we say, okay, let's pull that rack offline, right? So we suspend it, send it over to a queue, and then we'll have an engineer go out there and kind of go through and reapply all the security tools we have because we have a special configuration. Here's all the things we filter, or here's all the things we protect and make sure the configuration because sometimes when you got hundreds of thousands of servers, things are happening. In flight, right? So we this is one of the re ways we use the shadow server data set, right? So over in Equinix, check it out because you guys use it. But how do you use it, all right? What is the tool you use for? Um, we write our own scripts for for ourselves. So so basically, um, you know, I'm working with a, a bunch of teams in there. But from a shadow server education part, I'm going to be doing slides because there's a couple of open source projects. And then I'm actually going to talk to the uh, APNIC Foundation so that at the APNIC meetings, we'll have a hackathon on Shadow Server, right? To create some more open source tools to help pe people, people out with it because it's a valuable tool. But write the tool in such a way where it'd be like, um, it'd be like similar to like uh, Maltigo. And, when, you know, I, I'm wondering if I can actually use Maltigo on Shadow Server where you can then say, Here's one tool and we got several sources. Because that's what we did inside Akamai is we have a bunch of different feeds from different organizations, a lot of them free feeds because there's a lot of open source feeds and we pull them into this one tool. So we keep on adding, adding, and then it has an ability to take it within a NoSQL uh, database and then run, run a script every day with it. So that's... Uh, that's um, so that's a uh, 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 shadow server for that part. Um, and I think um, I'll put pointers in. So when the update, so I think what I'll do is some of these questions we put with it, I'll put, I'll update the slides, apricot slides. So, so that way people, you know, you know, share information, right? All right. So that's a good share. Asking other people what what um, anyone can suggest a reliable site that can captures um, recent and ongoing DDoS attacks. Reliable, uh, what's that again? The uh, sites or websites, reports, insights, websites. Websites, reliable that, websites. Yeah, I mean the data ongoing that captures ongoing and or recent DDoS attacks. Oh, on, on recent DDoS attacks or? Ongoing and recent. Uh, anybody have any of their tools? Is there any firewalls that Just like speaking about the firewall context, um, I think because um, for the FortiGuard, I believe if you subscribe for the FortiGate, if you subscribe on a FortiGuard service, there's like um, a database that they collate all the 
you know, those those sources, bad information, or you know, um, attacker and things like that. And it's get downloaded into your, you know, uh, database of your FortiGate, and then it uses that to, um, basically use for your uh, UTM protection, etc., protection for your um, whatever your user. So I think that's one way. I'm sure there's other sources for that. Um, that's only for the firewall. Um, if you're using if you're using your firewall, if you think of your firewall as a security, that's probably one way of dealing with that. But there's a lot of sources as well, I believe. So I think uh, there's a booth team C Y M R U. Yeah, they provide that services like uh, uh, using the PGP sessions. They continuously shares those. Uh, this is so Cymru has uh, a list of addresses, but the DDoS part is one of the areas that we get. I know that I'm a Team Cymru advisor. Okay, <laughs> so of their feed types, um, if you come tomorrow, I'll walk everybody through this uh, tomorrow. All right, um, because to the live feeds, and I'll uh, is this a question? Is this being recorded? They turn off the camera. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me. It's not. Oh, I'm showing the wrong screen. Okay. Stop sharing. Let's share a screen. So I'll just share the screen instead like this. And that way I can show this one there. Okay, so um, there was a collaboration community. This is why I said about Equinix, getting Equinix involved, right, with it. There's a collaboration community where we know what's going on with the attacks. Like, for instance, the hacktivists doing their activities you know, during with the cyber war or the stuff going on with China and Taiwan, you know, we tap into the telegram channels and the details. When you go out there and you put out your honey nuts, we got a combination of different honey nuts. Um, we're coming up with a system that I'll explain tomorrow in the workshop uh, called Bloodhound, which is kind of like after two years of work on doing DDoS suppression, right? Because we've been suppressing. <laughs> the DDoS today isn't as bad as it was three years ago because we've been suppressing it as an industry. And there's reasons why I can explain with it tomorrow with it, but that's how the ways to plug, plug into it. So the, the ones who get active with it, you kind of plug in. And what we're doing is we're inviting more organizations to participate part of the DDoS suppression. And part of DDoS suppression is there's two parts of it. There is, or three parts of it. Number one is participate, do, 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 All right? You don't have to have a perfect network, just, you know, Every week you spend 30 minutes and you do your part. Every single week. So this is one of the changes I'll talk about tomorrow. This is that the way to do DDoS suppression is it's like a it's a drumbeat, whack, whack, whack. You just keep doing this to the bad guys, right? And you take care of your part and saying, here's what I do. I participate, I speak up, say here's like what we the, every week, 30 minutes, everybody gets here's a list of things we kind of do to work with it. All right. And then you take care of your network, right? Because you get the shadow server report. And like I said, Alakamai, we get like, oh my God, we got all this stuff we got to go fix, right? That's, you know, take care of your network because your network is being used for attacks, whether you know it or not, right? And then to actually do help with the backtracing. And then if you, somebody calls you up and say, hey, uh, the bad guy's on your network, can you go out there and do source address validation on that particular port? Or law enforcement calls up and says, please don't put source address validation on that port yet. <laughs> Can we get NetFlow off your network? Because there's two parts of what we do with DDoS suppression. Part one is the community collaborating every week, go, go, here's a list, whack, right? And the other part is law enforcement. Oh, they're under arrest, right? Now, law enforcement can't solve the hacktivist problem. They can't solve the cyber war problem state actors in cyber war. But we got these criminals out there and we can keep the criminals pushing against them. And we got the commercials 
because there's commercial threat actors. So that we'll talk about more about this tomorrow with the list of the, the reports with it. Um, if we weren't recording, I would jump in and say, like, well, let's look what uh, Killnet and Killnet's doing right now, because we see the attacks live with it. Um, and what we're going to be doing with the Bloodhound evolution of this is we take that telemetry and we will actually tell the entire community the attack has started. Trigger your script. So each organization like Google, Amazon, Akamai, everybody will have their little scripts and say, okay, trigger your script, go look, All right? The attack has started. So everybody sees the attack start because we see the command and control signal. And then you kind of quickly look, capture the details and say, here's where it's coming in from. You backtrace it. And then you get a signal that says attack has stopped. Because we see attack start, attack stop, attack start, attack stop. We see these signals, we tap into it. And now we're gonna tie all these systems together Right, and then you write a tool, right? Like tomorrow, I'll talk about the one of the tools we put open source called Tattletail that Charter Communications wrote, and they share with everybody. And then you, you use that to, to plug into your system and then push back. And then the ransomware community, ransomware slash APT, is looking at doing similar methodology. You know, because that's a different they're different communities specializing in different things. So in other words, we can push we can push back at the the miscreants. So this is a good question. This is uh, on it. So that's your request with it. How about you? Here's Mike. So my question is threat intelligence. Why do you have to pay for a lot of it? The, if vendors didn't make money from it and security was free, I think we'd have better security. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. I guess this becomes a, a, a good uh, So um, if you're interested, think he's me. If all of a sudden you see a big blog saying, go do this right now, it means within the operator community, something's bad's going on. And this is kind of like the TLP white exit point we use within a lot of service providers. Um, but on here, to your question, So I used to do this feed. So this five, six years ago is the place to go with it, right? It shows a lot of different sites. But now I've been doing all my updates and I really need to redo this page. You go to Herman's site, right? So this guy right here, Herman, um, he took all the stuff I was doing and a couple of other people were doing and he stuck it all on GitHub. Yeah, it's good. I've got that. Yeah, you got this, right? So Herman's site is, you can, and this is uh, something I was talking with um, Akamai's 13 um, uh, lead, is I used to have an Altigo site where I had a lot of these feeds, but then I was busy doing other things and then the image broke and never got around to fix it. But now in Akamai, employees get free access to Linode. <laughs> so I'm gonna fire up, uh, I'm basically gonna rebuild going to Herman's site with it. Right. So this has a lot of resources for like, you know, threat intelligence. And what happens is, and we see this inside inside Akamai, is we'll go out there and we'll say, here's a commercial feed, here's a Herman feed. And we'll look at how come the Herman feed is better than the paid feed? Right. Like for instance, people say, Oh, you need to do attack surface monitor. And I go, like, uh, have you started with Shadow Server yet? <laughs> right. You know, now are they free? Not for anything like this. Open source is not free because somebody has to put energy into it to maintain it, right? So it's either energy that I donate my time, or like in Shadow Server's new model, you have alliance contributors every every year, and they contribute money to maintain the cyber civil defense for the internet, right? But they had, the the goal is cyber civil defense, right? Team Cymru has feeds, like you were talking about Team Cymru. Team Cymru has some feeds you can get from them that is not commercial. You just ask Jocko, right, on that. There are others. But you're, this is, yeah, I find uh, the worst case of it is, remember Comficker? 
everybody the Conficker uh, malware. So I was part of the Conficker working group, and then we found out that some company was selling to a U.S. three-letter agency the Conficker feed for a million dollars a month. We went, what the frack? Anybody can get it for free. So this is the thing that I, I always, I'm a big advocate of, of uh, and me being a vendor. I mean, I spent years at Cisco, years at Juniper, and even then I say, open source first. Open source first. Use the open source first. You'll learn. You'll be educated. You get clue. You find out what you then need more of, right? And you're not going to be ripped off. That's my personal philosophy of how to build out systems. Open source first. Open source may not be the best answer for you, but it's the starting place. Because then you'll be walking into with more knowledge. Always open source first. So that's a good one. All right, next mic. <laughs> Pass around. We're asking like questions you would ask, ask everybody. And we'll go in a weird Okay. <laughs> okay. I guess what I'm most interested in is, uh, for the most part, security and traditional networks are very linear, very black and white. Uh, coming from a research and exchange uh, environment, are there any unique ways to secure my network without compromising that research exchange aspect? Are you plugged into the REN ISAC? Yes, we are. Yeah, okay. Um, I think that's always a challenge. Like, what do you mean by compromise of network security uh, or, or compromise of your research? What do you what do you mean by that? Oh, well, you know, in security, it's very well for a traditional network, it's very easy to just say, hey, I'm gonna block this, I'm gonna prevent this from coming in. Uh in our in our environment, at least you do that, and that pretty much comp uh you lose Block, your data. Yeah, that and communication with uh for researchers that might be in more compromising aspects of the internet mm -hmm. who don't know any better. They just want to collaborate and talk to other researchers without a care in the world for their network security. So mm. that's where we come in, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's reason reason to be here with that. I know from my personal experience in setting up networks, I always set up sections of my networks that's outside of the DMZ, so I can put stuff out there that isn't going through my corporate security policies, right? And that's actually some recommendations set in the past from the Ren ISAC community to do the same thing. To have here's the things I use to protect my university properties and the students and the faculty, and then here's the stuff that you have to stick out with research. Um, Kata, are you familiar with Kata? Some are. Um, so I'll show two two things real quick. Uh, so on so right here, there is a project to look at from Kata called Gimme. Uh, this one right here. So you can look this one up. Um, so one, the link on here goes to CADA. CADA is um, at the University of, San Diego, University of San Diego Computer Center, right? So um, they do a lot of the research and they on how Dr. Kim Caffrey sets up her network for do, doing the research. She teaches other universities. Here's how you can set up. You know, like for instance, um, uh, I first started working with uh, Casey, uh, Kim Caffrey, in 96, the Internet Telescope Project, and they still have their telescope going. So the University of Michigan and San Diego State Supercomputer Center had slash eights. So you took the slash eights and you start using like, because you get backscatter and scans and things like that. So she still got that set up where you got all, all the dark IP space outside the security of the university. So in other words, um, dark IP space is IP address space that you don't have a device connected to, right? So that's a dark IP space. So she has, for instance, set up where that is going to uh, sinkholes and monitoring devices outside the DMZ. 
So all her researchers can get all that dirty traffic, right? That's that's an example of a of an architectural design thing to 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 do that. Um, so within your university, it's kind of like you build these dialogues to say, here's these architectural principles you can set up to make sure you get access to the data. This community here is uh, the Gimme Three. So this is third round. Uh, Kim Caffrey, Dave Clark. You know anybody who knows Dave Clark from MIT? Famous computer scientist, network designer. Um, you know uh, several textbooks on how to scale the internet, right? Is Dave Dave Clark? They're both the the uh, principal um, investigators for this uh, uh, piece piece of work, and they're doing international work. So if you do inter work with this, you can reach out to Kata and say, "Hey, Barry says we should talk," and they'll be like, "Oh, okay," because we're we're tying researches together um, with it. And then what we do within this like the anti DDoS and malware community is we want researchers along with us, because as like me as somebody who builds networks and keeps networks up and running and investigates badness, I don't have time to do the the disciplined study. So what you do is you design your says okay we're going to take action against DDoS. You get researchers to go with you. Right, and the researchers are tagging along, and they respect the traffic light protocol (TLP Amber, TLP Red) till we get to a, a phase, and then they go write papers. Right, start doing the research, and then you kind of look at their paper and go like, "Oh, that's what we did. Oh, I didn't realize that," because they'll see things as a researcher that we won't see because we're like we're looking at it like this, aged. Right, they can step back. And give a perspective, and we go like, ah. right? So, so this is this is uh, reach out to Kata. If you can't get their address, contact me. I can give introductions. So that's a that's a that's a very good uh, hard question there. Yeah. What we've done with some of our membership or customers that um, you know set up a science DMZ. Basically, um, you know, traffic that goes uh, out of your corporate firewall policies goes through that. So it's like um, it's bypassing your corporate firewall, really. But then you actually have to enable some kind of an endpoint security on your TTNs, you know, that's used by your researchers. You know, So that's one way of dealing with that. Um, but it's not for everyone because uh, there's a lot of pushback as well from the security guys. <laughs> we should not be doing that. It should Everything should go through the firewall. But, you know. There's some there should be some compromise. But yeah, the science DM said which was um designed and uh, deployed first by ESNet. That's what we've been following. That's one of the solutions that we've implemented with some of our customers or members. No, we have uh, also some uh this kind of problem at the university. Uh uh, what we do is that we uh, we bypass the uh, firewall for some uh, some department, or for example, computer science, because they have a lot of uh, people who are crazy doing some crazy things uh, with the internet. So we let them do. If they have a problem, they have to solve it by themselves. Okay. Next. <laughs> Uh, str struggling a little bit for a question for the audience, but uh, I guess uh, a little bit more of a question for you, I guess, is um, Sh Shadow Server is a good resource for protecting enterprise and uh, protecting uh, your corporate. But uh, when you're a residential ISP and your infrastructure has all the eyeballs, uh, what, what's your expectation around that? Like you can get that space monitored because you're the ISP. Do you expect the average residential ISP to care what's going on in their rival networks? Um, if you come to session tomorrow, like one of the things that, um, one of the things we're running into is that the miscreants, the DDoS threat actors and some of the ransomware players are hiding behind proxies. Now in a residential environment, going out there, like shadow server tell you, here's all the proxies, but the proxies are good, bad, ugly. 
which of the good, bad, and ugly are being abused, right? So the good are like, it's a commercial, it's a, it's a, it's a VPN service. It's like something like that. This is good. You pay service, right? You know, the bad is like, okay, I, I'm pirating so I can get to Netflix or get to Amazon, right? So that's a, that's a bad. And the ugly is like, okay, it's actually malware that you don't even know you've got installed, right? So, so, but you got so much of it. What do you work on? So one of the things we're doing is setting up telemetry so we can actually so show with a ransom in APT and DDoS that, okay, uh, you have 30,000 customers with proxies. These 10 are ones you should pay attention to. And Shadow Server is doing that now, or is that another part project? of this new uh, system we're doing up with Shadow Server? So you got the open proxy reports right now, and then these are the enhancements going into the open proxy uh, reports. There's a new DDoS report that that just came out. And then we're going to have like all the anti-DDoS players are going to feed into that. In other words, if somebody attacks Akamai uh, over the next year, I'm going to set up with each of the different services that we, we detect DDoS is then feed that into that report. And then NetScout's going to do the same and Amazon's going to do the same. And also we have all this telemetry of these active attacks fed into the system. And then that gives reports to the residential. So you can say, okay, what's important to me right now? Because you only have so much time. Now, the reason for the reason for that is one of the things that's not well known is we call it the SBC experiment. So back in 2005, uh, SBC, which is now AT&T, so it's the Texas part of AT&T that bought the New Jersey part. SBC Texas bought AT&T New Jersey and became AT&T. Okay. So the New Jersey AT&T is very researcher, Bell Labs. What's the future, right? The Texas team is very attached to the oil industry and is very data, 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 data. They're, they're big data geeks. And so they went and said, we're going to clean up all the residential infections on our network, all the way down from the big boss. It's in 2005. I was at Cisco at the time. And they, let, they started doing this whole process, right? Say, so feed us the data to show who's infected. And they would call up or they would send email notifications, right? They say, you're infected. Right? And then they started going through and they ran into uh, what I call the, um, there's a talk um, where VJ Gill, bless his soul, he was up on stage talking about this problem. He was at AOL at the time. And I gave a story about my mom at the time. And my mom was complaining because I got two sons who were geeks and my computer got infected. And it was, you know, you're never around when I need you, but I called AOL and AOL was so nice. I spent like 10 hours on the phone with them, cleaning up my computer. And that's an SBC. SBC realized that as soon as they pick up the phone, the call SBC to get fixed, they had just lost all ARPU for the next month. And if they're on the phone for two minutes, they lost ARPU for the next six months. And they go out and try to fix it. They will never make any profit from that customer ever. So this is the SBC data point of what we are very mindful of when people say, oh, why don't the residential people clean things up? Nope, not going to happen. It's just economically not feasible. Uh, a slight side comment. Um, I don't know if anyone else has seen this as well, but uh, one of the ironies we have seen uh, in industry is that uh, it doesn't look very different from a, a legitimate, hey, you have a virus, let us help you fix it to a scam call. Yes. An end user thinks you're scamming them. <laughs> so, and, and that's the that's the change from 2005 to today. Today, you, you know, 2005, SBC would be able to pick up the phone and call somebody. Today, you're getting, you know, scam artists out of India and Thailand, you know, going through and calling people up and how do I trust you? So there's no, there's zero, zero trust between anybody who contacts you with email, SMS, right? You know, every day I get like an email. Hey, uh, thank you for being a Norton, you know, customer. And we're renewing your contract. And what they want you to do is call. <laughs> or I'm in this, I don't know what it is. I, I go from Singapore, right? 
and I land in Singapore, I land in the United States. So this happened last week. I come from Singapore, I land in the United States so I can go to the, the MOG uh, meeting. And all of a sudden my phone starts going beep, 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 beep of people saying like scam calls. I think they're tied into the at t SMS system or, or, you know, whatever they're doing, right? It's just like, so it's a, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to solve that problem. That's the problem is uh, how do you do, do trust, trust, get, oh, your refrigerator is infected, right? So um, I think that, but that topic there is a good topic to bring up maybe for another apricot where we recruit like uh, Matt Crothers from Cox. Cox um, is, you know, which is a residential and what they do for doing security on their residential environment. You know, some of the architecture stuff. So I'll, I'll take a note of that one. That's a, be a good one. Other, yeah. Uh, if we have time, um, I guess it's linked to well, both of those, but um, how do you, I guess, secure your network and well devices and stuff or employees and things without being a hindrance to them because i have encountered where it's like extremely locked down but the issue isn't is like i almost found from my experience that the more you lock it down the harder they try to get like around for you know, like a dodgy proxy site or something like that or yeah. a phishing email and that's not gonna you know, DNA shadow blocking. shadow it and things like yeah yeah it's always a delicate balance um i know we've you know within the akamai experience it's that's a core theme right and that led us to um the path of the next generation of micro segmentation right within the network and then that led us to micro segmentation company we were buying we were, oh why don't we buy them? And that's where we bought our core because we're using it everywhere, right? Is to, to go through and say, how do you not hinder, but you got to see what goes on that lateral, that uh, the cert NZ diagram. You know, it's a lot of it is that lateral. How do you, how you can tap in to say, okay, if this block got violated, how do you see that so you can actually do something uh, with it? Um, and then you also spot the shadow IT. Because a lot of times people will look at protect the device versus defect uh, uh, plan in the here's the movement, right? And this goes into I do talks where I talk about uh, you do security through behavioral analytics, where you look at the because computers don't do ransomware, computers don't you know even with the AI, the AI is going to be learning from a human being. It's a human being behind it, so it's a human who is doing DOS attacks. It's a human. Is doing ransomware. It's a human to do an APT. So you go, okay, what is that human thinking? You know, um, give an example. Um, Google Aurora, the Aurora attacks. You know, the network I was working at the time, it was like they were gone right after the compilers. So when Solar Winds happened, you know, a bunch of us go like, yeah, because a certain type of hacker, state actor, hacker goes after your most valuable property. And so you identify to like your point on data, what is the most valuable property? What's the thing they go really go after? And you identify that. Then you walk through what is the, what is the path they have to do to get there? So, and by mapping the path first, say, okay, I'm gonna have one swim lane of activity to secure that path and alert. And then the other path is how do I, um, like um, the way I like to do data security is assume it's going to get stolen. So the, the type of encryption, the type of backups, the type of you know um, privacy, the rules for how much, how long you keep the data, all those sort of things to be compliant. You do compliant, G, we're GDPR compliant with the assumption that somebody's going to grab that data and take it off the network. And if you take it off the network, you make it useless, right? But step one is what's the path, All right? So that's a good one. So hopefully I'll see you guys tomorrow for the workshop. Sign up, you know, connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, anytime you guys, you know, since you guys stuck it out here, anytime you guys want to like have a conversation, I get on and talk to in people all the time, All right?
Um, I'm in California, Singapore second home. You know, and everything works out, then New Zealand would be the other anchor. <laughs> so I'll be so I and I understand here, right? Because I've since um, you know, my wife is a Singaporean Indian, I've been all over, built out the internet. That was like, you know, been involved with the Apricot community and APNIC from the very beginning, you know, and doing everything we're doing right here. So I'm I'm a big like, you know, you want to talk about some sort of security stuff, call me. And Sometimes I know. If I don't know, I know who knows. And then I get connected to the person who knows. <laughs> you know, like uh, the RE question. Connect you to Kana. Connect you to experts. You know, there you go. So thank you. And I will, I will take what we said here and I'll think about it tonight and put it in the slides and take the slides and update. So, so we have some pointers to some notes of things we talked about. You know, so uh, help you guys out.